This is an interview at the Public Library Center, Mauritius, New York. Uh, it is the 10th of March, 2004. Um, it is approximately 10.30 a.m. Interviewers are Wayne Clark and Mike Russert. Could you give me your full name, date of birth, and place of birth, please? Okay. Full name is Joseph Nidick. No middle initial. It would have been better if I did have a middle initial, because now I had to put NMI all the time. My place of birth was uh, New York City, and the, the date uh, was October 1, 1922. Okay. Do you, uh, could you tell me what your educational background okay. was prior to entering service? Okay. Just prior to going into the service, uh, I was uh, attending uh, City College of New York at night, studying mechanical engineering, and I belonged to the ROTC, which re required me to go down uh, one afternoon uh, a, a week and, uh, and drill with them. Mm -hmm. And it was basically an infantry outfit, and uh, then we got into bayonet practice, and uh, I, I wasn't too happy with bayonet practice. I didn't like the idea of jabbing somebody in the belly with that thing, or vice versa, him doing it to me, you know? So I persuaded my parents uh, to go along with my idea of trying to get into the uh, Army Air Corps. And uh, I went through the various physical examinations, and I had no trouble, uh, except when it came to the, uh, the color test. And uh, they told me that I'm colorblind, you know. I couldn't believe it. That, a New York kid who never was exposed to this before, I couldn't believe I was colorblind. And I wrote a letter to the Surgeon General asking for re-examination, uh, saying that basically I think it was just a nervousness uh, uh -huh. and I, I wanted to get tested again. In the meantime, there was a, uh, an optometrist shop in the neighborhood, and they had these color shots, ironically, in the window. And I was studying those color charts like crazy to see whether I can really uh, pick it up. But it was, obviously, that was a, not the greatest thing to do. Anyway, I got my appointment uh, with the uh, people in uh, 39 Whitehall Street, which was uh, First Army headquarters at that time. And I went down there, and I met a captain, medical officer, who was not a happy person. He was annoyed uh, with me for making uh, him take the time. He said, you're colorblind, you're colorblind, and there isn't anything you can do about it. I said, well, number one, I don't think I am colorblind. I think it's just nervous. And I have an appointment for re-examination. All right, so he gets out the, the book of plates and everything like that. I know I'm getting myself in deeper there. And uh, up in the corner, in the right-hand corner, inverted on each of these plates was a number in ink, you know because I would look at these plates, not all of them, but many of them, and some of them, forget about it, but I figured this must be something to tell the, the interviewer whether it's the right number or not. I have nothing to lose. I'll come up with that number, you know. And sure in hell, to make a long story short, I passed the color test. And uh, that was, uh, I had uh, volunteered on, I think it was July 6th, 1942, and they called me up, uh, on, uh, I think it was 14 January 1943, uh, to uh, go down to, to uh, Pennsylvania Station or Grand Central, I think it was Grand Central Station, uh, to, uh, we're going to San Antonio Aviation Cadet Center in Texas as an aviation cadet. So I was elated. I was thrilled with the damn thing. And then we got on the train. I remember it was, a, it was a coach train. And 78 hours later, we got down to Texas. I remember I woke up in the morning and it was freezing in that damn thing. And the windows were coated with frost. And we were in Buffalo. <laughs> so I suppose it was basically a troop train. They had to make a circuit around and pick up a lot of people. Anyway, we finally got down to uh, San Antonio three o'clock in the morning, standing at attention, and, uh, oh, we had to drop our pants, because they have a short arm inspection, <laughs> number one, to make sure you, which is very essential, you see. And uh, it's now about, what, 3.30 in the morning, four o'clock in the morning, they dump some blankets in my, my arms, and they point out the, the barracks to which I was assigned. And I got in there, and uh, 
I managed to wake up the poor guy who was uh, the, the bottom bunk. I was the top bunk. I finally got up on the top bunk, and just as I got settled, reveille. I had to get up <laughs> and into formation. Anyway, uh, we went through what was the equivalent of uh, basic training. They called it, I think, pre-flight training at that time in San Antonio, where you had ground school and you had drill and calisthenics and mm -hmm. obstacle course and all that good stuff. And uh, I had elected uh, to take pilot training. You had three choices, either pilot, uh, bombardier, or navigator. I had wanted uh, pilot training, and I was uh, successful in, in passing whatever criteria they, they needed for that. And uh, the only problem, I went through the, the pre-flight training, and then we went to Corsicana, Texas, which where we flew these, uh, they would look like Piper Cubs. You know, very pretty little airplane, open cockpit, with the helmet and the goggles and the whole rigmarole and a parachute. And, and I was. Now, had, had you ever flown up until no, this point? No, no. I remember I used to drive up, if you know, well, of course, I'm sure you know New York State, but in lower New York State, Kensico Reservoir, when you drive up the, uh, uh, at that time it was, a, it was a Taconic Parkway, uh, and you can cross across the Kensico Reservoir to the other side and they had a little dirt field there and a friend of mine and I used to drive up there and watch the planes take off. We didn't have the money to go up in the damn thing. But anyway, that was my only acquaintance with, uh, with airplanes. You know? So this was a complete novelty. Mm -hmm. But uh, I liked it. I had no problem with the uh, air work. The thing I did have a problem with is in landings. Uh, they were not good. And eventually, uh, they had to put you up. You see, they had civilian uh, instructors. These fellows were former old barnstorming pilots from the, from the 1920s. Terrific, terrific bunch of guys. They all looked like Gary Cooper. And, I, I, and uh, nice guys, but I guess there's a limit to, to the time they could spend with somebody that has a problem with landing. So they put you up for what they call an E-ride, an elimination ride with an army pilot. And usually the army pilot with whom you ride is an unhappy guy because he figured he'd be out flying fighters and getting all kinds of medals and stuff like that, and he's stuck with a bunch of klutzes like us. Uh, but that was the, it's so ironic because on that ride, when I came back, I had no problem with the air work, with the spins, the stalls, and everything else. Uh, I came. I never made a landing that beautiful <laughs> before, and, and uh, you know I was elated with that. But well, you should have done it before. You had your eight hours, and that's it. And I tell you, that absolutely shattered me. Uh, but that's the way the cookie crumbles. And uh, I had qualified uh, uh, by virtue of the examinations for uh, for the navigation school as well. So they had to wait for an opening uh, in, in a navigation school. And uh, then in the interim, we went uh, down in the, in, the, in the tents there in Texas and the Black Widow Spiders and all that happy thing. And uh, eventually an opening came up in the, uh, in the navigation school in Hondo, Texas. I remember that. Uh, and that was, uh, I went through that with, with uh, no trouble at all and graduated in January 1944. I think, uh, well, it's a, it's a hypothesis on my part. Uh, if I had graduated as a pilot uh, within the time frame that I should have, I don't think I would be talking with you today because the attrition rate at that time in the European theater uh, was quite rough. <coughs> anyway, I became a navigator. And they sent me for additional training to Langley Field, Virginia, uh, to take up radar. Because in the European theater in wintertime, uh, it's very rare that you could see the ground. So they used this new Rube Goldberg equipment. I thought it was something that was fantastic. Uh, and uh, I went through that training, studying r radar navigation, and became a radar navigator. And eventually, uh, they found a slot. They had an opening in, uh, in the European theater, and I was sent overseas. I think that was in August of uh, 44. 
I was uh, assigned to a bombardment group. Uh, Excuse me, you were sent over as a replacement rather with a, yeah. you know, with a crew. Right. No. This is a very, uh, it's a unique situation being a, a radar navigator. Uh, usually crews in the United States train together, train together yes. out west and everything like that, and then flew overseas together, so forth and so on. And they usually picked up uh, a radar navigator in the combat theater. So you're assigned to a particular crew mm -hmm. at a point. Now, the unfortunate part about that for the crew is they have to let their ball turret gunner go because what uh, in a Pathfinder aircraft, which is what we operated, what was a ball turret is now a space for a radar antenna. Looked like a big condom that uh, goes down at the, uh, the bottom of the airplane. So they had to let the, uh, the ball turret uh, the fellow go, but uh, the people with whom I had flown, I flew with three different crews, were a beautiful bunch of guys. They didn't uh, make you feel, you know, as if you'd, you hurt them to some extent by coming on board. And uh, I wound up uh, flying with one crew for about, uh, they were about, fi they were finishing up for about eight missions. And they had finished up their tour and I was assigned to another crew. Now what's unique, I don't know whether the other fellows with whom you talked have told you about it, uh, with the Pathfinder aircraft, the co-pilot of the crew, the co-pilot of your crew, flies in the tail as a formation control officer to make sure everybody's in nice and tight. He's also the tail gunner at the same time. I think you're the first fellow we yeah. interviewed in that situation. Yeah. On, the, on the Pathfinder aircraft, this is the way they operated. And the crew, uh, first pilot, now moved over from the left seat to the right seat, and they usually put a command pilot, anything from a uh, major on up to a general, depending on the importance of the mission and how many planes that you were, you were leading. So uh, within the... We had a, the, the regular crew navigators still stayed on board, and of course the regular bombardier, they were up in the nose, which is the navigator's position up there. I was in the radio room with the radar equipment, and right across from me was the uh, radio operator. And uh, when, we, uh, when we flew, first of all, I'm, I'm sure the other fellows will tell you about the risk of re repetition. Uh, again, in that theater, it was about two hours of forming all the airplanes going around. I remember marching on a parade on Fifth Avenue with the ROTC one time, and, uh, and all the uh, streets uh, adjacent to Fifth Avenue, the different units would line up and they would gradually come into formation and walk uh, up uh, the street. This was the same idea in that theater, uh -huh. only here, they, they were following a radio beacon on the ground, and you would uh, pick up your own squadron, then your own group, all around that beacon until you had a, a whole wing of airplanes, and you would go across the channel, one, one wing after the other wing, in, in formation. And uh, it was a big parade. That's exactly what it was. And then once getting into the, uh, uh, the enemy territory, usually at that point, each uh, wing would have probably a different, different uh, target that are assigned to it. But anyway, that, that procedure took about two hours, during which time I had nothing to do. As a radar operator, I did nothing. That was basically <clears throat> the navigator up in the nose, and of course the pilots that uh, were responsible for that forming. Can I stop a second? Sure. How many in a crew of a, a Pathfinder aircraft? We had the, uh, I guess the same ten people, Mm -hmm. uh, the pilot, co-pilot, bombardier, crew navigator, me, the radar navigator, radio operator, you had the waste gunners, left and right waste gunners, mm -hmm. and the, uh, well, the co-pilot was in the tail as, as a tail gunner. Well, I don't know what that adds up Did to. Did you have an upper uh, ball turret gunner? Or gunner on the... the top turret. Top no, turret. top turret, that's, that's the engineer. The engine it was right behind the pilot. Yeah, the, the top turret. He handled the top turret. And uh, 
and off we would go to uh, wherever we had to go. Now, from the time we left uh, the British coast uh, on into the target, that was basically my headache because most of the time you couldn't see the ground. And uh, when we got within the uh, area that uh, was the target area, we would uh, go into a, uh, a point called an initial point where you begin a bomb run and you, then you go on for about 40 or 50 miles at a given altitude and at a given rate of speed. And uh, my job, because I was set up the equipment, uh, with a, with a, uh, it was calibrated so that I could feed readings over the intercom to the bombardier, who in turn would uh, put them into the northern bomb site, you see. And that's, uh, for the most part, is the, the way we operated in that area. Uh, because unless, if at any time during the course of that bomb run, the bombardier could see the ground, then he would take over immediately with, with, with the bomb site. So we uh, essentially operated that way. Uh, I, uh, I remember the, the, when I was assigned initially uh, to a barracks over there, I was in with a bunch of guys. One group uh, was, was a lead crew that had flown to 25 missions, and that's all they had to fly at, at that point in time. They finished their tour, and they could rotate to the States for 30 days, and then go, go into the Pacific Theater. Uh, these fellows wanted to uh, fly a second tour in Europe. Rather, they, didn't, they didn't want to disband the crew, that's number one. So they said, we'll stick together and we'll fly a second tour in Europe. And my first mission with them, they were leading, a, uh, we were, I think we had a group at that time. We were deputy lead of a group of airplanes. I forgot them, about 35, 40 bombers. And uh, we were on our way to a target called Merseburg. Now, to me, it meant nothing. I remember in the, in the, in the, in the briefing room, uh, the guys that were sighing and uh, ooing and owing uh, when that target came up, because it was uh, uh, the largest uh, synthetic oil refinery in the world and very, very heavily defended. And usually it was... Uh, an unhappy trip when you're going in there, you know. And this was no exception. Uh, to me, it meant nothing. I had never been exposed to it before. But we went in, and, um, you know, like, uh, being in the radio room without any windows, as a matter of fact, I had a black curtain uh, alongside of me between myself and the radio operator so that I could see the screen, the radar screen, better. And, of course, you can hear what's going on, you know. And then I remember, this is my first time, I remember hearing somebody, with one of the gunners saying, holy shit, one of our fighters just went right through our wingman, cut him right in half, you know, keep your eye out for shoots and stuff like that. Right away, I said, this is not a happy situation, you know. And I, I look around, we weren't attacked by fighters, but there were fighters hitting the group ahead of us. And uh, I remember... We're on the bomb run now, and these, these uh, second tour guys were the ones that are leading it, and they were blown right out of the air. And uh, we assumed lead position, did what we had to do. And uh, I had looked up, uh, the radar said it's here, looked to my right, and a little above, and there's a hole in the airplane, because the, there's an auxiliary screen just behind my head of exactly what I'm looking at. I don't know whether the controls are set up so that when, once we go on a bomb run, that thing is activated. So it starts taking pictures so that intelligence can uh, uh, monitor as <clears throat> how effective we were on a radar bomb run. Well, Flack had come in and smashed the camera right behind my head, uh, which didn't make me happy very uh, at all, you know, but it didn't touch me. So we, we, uh, we, we got out of the target area uh, without uh, too much, uh, except flak damage. And we were coming back over to Zyda Z, and there must have been a, a four-gun battery down there that must have been checked out for years on this stuff, because everything they put up hit us. And uh, 
they hit uh, the, the tail gunner, the, the flak came in and took uh, a, a big hunk out of his leg and uh, he came crawling into the waist, uh, bleeding like a stuck pig and uh, uh, they managed to put a tourniquet on him and we were firing red red flares to give us priority in landing because you've got a hell of a lot of airplanes coming back at almost the same time and usually the weather wasn't too happy either. But uh, he made out all right. But I tell you, I had uh, said to myself, how the hell am I going to get through 24 more of these things, you know? But thank God they weren't all that way. But anyway, uh, I, I, so that I don't completely bore you, uh, during the course of one of these missions, later on with a different crew, a terrific bunch of guys, this is the picture of them here. Okay, why don't you hold this up in front of you. When, when was that taken? Oh, God, this must have been taken in 1944 sometime. Mm -hmm. No, we're about to see you in Where the picture. Both Where are you in the photograph? The tall guy over here. Okay. Now, um, did your crew, did, you, did any of you decorate jackets or anything like that? Did yeah. Did you ever decorate your yes, jacket? Yes, uh, I had a, a leather jacket which was decorated and other fellows did. Mm -hmm. But we wore basically this type right. of uh, a, a situation. Yes, the answer is yes, they did have that. Mm -hmm. Now, I can see there's a name on the plane. What? Stinky. Like, Stinky. Okay. Stinky. Actually, they, they, this used to be their airplane, but when they became a lead crew, now they, they're, they're flying Pathfinder aircraft, which is not the same as, it's not their airplane. Mm -hmm. But uh, what's unique about this, and in particular, that picture, one day, uh, my, we get together uh, every once in a while, the guys that are left, and my pilot had said, you know, I had a very uh, odd situation happen. A fellow came to see me who was uh, an executive with a Has Hasbro Toys. They made uh, G.I. Joe. Uh -huh. This fellow happened to be in Ohio on some kind of an assignment, and uh, he stopped into Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. And we have an exhibit in there, World War II exhibit. And he was so impressed with this narrative that you see over here, which was up uh, on display, with the narrative of a, a, this particular mission, that he took, uh, there was a picture that was also on display, which as you see here, this is probably the same picture, and he took that along with a lot of other things and had the company reproduce it in China in miniature oh, with the picture. I see that, yes. Oh, this yes. is so unique. I mean, it, <laughs> this wouldn't happen again in a million years. I'll be done. And it was for sale. Uh, people told me it was on the, Re the Regis Philbin show and on the Today show. But they, they was on, I guess, I guess about three or four years ago, there was, it was for sale okay. at Christmas time, and they were all sold out. But I thought it was such a unique thing uh, that... Uh, you wouldn't think would happen in a million years. But that's basically it. We went through uh, the rest of our missions, and uh, most of us uh, got back in one piece. And it's a very, uh, very uh, simple story. Now, did you uh, wear a flak jacket? Once. That time, the, my first mission, when I saw that hole <laughs> in the airplane behind my head, I put the chap, but that was like, you know, like a catcher's uh, mm -hmm. get up, you know. Mm -hmm. And it was such a pain in the neck because you had so much other equipment on you. The, uh, the May West, the, uh, the parachute harness, and everything like that. And now to put this thing on, the hell with it. What's going to happen is going to happen. So after that, I, I never, never wore a, a flak vest. I know a lot of guys sat on them, though. Yeah, <laughs> a lot of, because a lot of stuff comes up, you yeah. know. And uh, Now in this article, uh, this is this is your plane. Yes. Uh, you've engine damage, your tail, uh, heavy damage to the tail. Uh, did you receive that from flak or? Uh, no, fighter. Fighter. It was, uh, an, an, I think it was an ME-262. Oh, the a jet. jet. Jet fighter. And we, we didn't know what the hell they were. They came in, and they must have been doing about 600 miles an hour. They came in and almost wiped us out completely. Okay. 
and uh, then went through the, the formation and, and took off, you know. But uh, we had no, had no experience with jets before. And we thank God because uh, from what I understand, there were, there were 1,400 of these jet fighters in bunkers, uh, uh, well protected, but they didn't have the fuel to put them up because we were attacking their, uh, the, their oil refineries and everything like that. But if they did have the fuel to put them up, we would have had a very, very rough time. Yeah, he did, did an excellent job. So that was basically all cannon fire from Yeah, that was, yeah, 30 millimeter cannon fire. Excuse me. Now, um, did your plane separate from, from the others? Oh, yeah. And we, went, we went down, and this uh, narrative will say so to some degree. Luckily, there was an undercast we could <clears> duck into because we couldn't uh, maintain flying altitude. It was extremely difficult to turn the airplane because our stabilizers were pretty badly shot up. And uh, between the use of the remaining engines, and pulling back on the others, uh, and the, oh, that's something else I must tell you. A shell that came in the, in the waist had uh, cut all our oxygen out. We were at, I guess, about 25,000 here. Knocked out the oxygen and cut the control cables to what was left of the rudder and everything else. And the, the gunners back there, and, and the, and the co-pilot, who was the, also the tail gunner, pulled their electrically heated uh, the, the, the cord, the extension cord, and between tying everything together, they, they, they managed to patch up these cables to, uh, to uh, be able to utilize, to some extent, the remains of the rudder and stuff like that. So between that and the fact that we ducked into this undercast, nobody followed us, because if they had come after us again, I think that's, that's what would have been it. And uh, we, we broke out of that damn thing, and a, a fighter came in. That's outlined in this narrative as well. A fighter came in, and our gunners opened up on him, and it was one of our own guys, you know. So he flipped up, and I realized, and, and we were able to, to, uh, to, to make a, an emergency field in, just outside of Brussels, just over the lines, you know, <clears throat> and get down in one piece. So it was a... Uh, a, year, a very unique experience, and uh, they sent us away for 10 days for, uh, for, for, for rest and recovery and to a beautiful 60-room mansion in, uh, well, around Oxford in, in Britain, you know. Mm -hmm. And that was, that was great. And, uh, of course, when we were through with that, we had to get back into the situation and with another bunch of guys and finish up our tour. But that's it. There's nothing, nothing, uh, well, I, I could tell you something else that was unique also. Being uh, in that position as a radar navigator, uh, you were assigned to, to a bunch of guys that finally made lead crew. They've been flying combat. It took them some time. They made lead crew, but they knew neophytes to actually flying lead, you know. And I was in the hospital for for something, oh yeah, shingles, I had shingles, I didn't know what the hell they were. And uh, they were flying milk runs, one after the other. I had never flown a milk run <laughs> in my whole tour. I had, uh, usually there were anything from eight to 11 hours, you know. And I was saying, gee, they're missing all these things to build up the missions and then get back home. So when I got through with the shingles, my crew was stood down, but they needed a radar navigator. And they said, you want to volunteer for something? I said, okay, which is uh, ridiculous because one of the adages in the service, don't volunteer for anything. But I volunteer for purely selfish purpose. I volunteer because I, I'd like to go on one of these milk runs and get it over with. Well, it happened to be uh, Hamburg. And I had been to Hamburg before, and uh, they were not hospitable there at all, you know. And sure in hell, and I'm not making this up, the same set of circumstances as happened uh, over here, we were attacked. Uh, as soon as we uh, dropped the bombs, we were attacked head on by conventional fighters. And uh, luckily, we managed uh, and all the rest of it to dive down very heavily 
and they went right over and didn't make a second pass. But, you know, I said to myself, deja vu, how many times did this happen, you know? So we were very lucky there, and uh, as I say, a great bunch of guys, and uh, they got back for the most part uh, in one piece. Things happen sometimes, uh, not due to the enemy at all, crazy things happen. I remember with the first crew, we were on a training flight in England, and the, uh, I think the Royal Artillery was monitoring us with their radar, their gun laying equipment, uh, uh, to see how effective we were. And anyway, uh, off in the distance uh, was, a, was a big Lancaster bomber, and our pilot wanted to get pictures of this guy. So he peeled off to get alongside the, the Lancaster, and the Lancaster took off, and that pissed him off. And so he said, no, no, no goddamn blimey is going to do that to me. So he put the, the plane at that time, he put it in a 90 degree bank, and the gyro must have tumbled. And as I said, I'm in the radio room, and down we went in a spin. I have a chest pack, which is by my side over here, on the floor. I couldn't get that, that pack off the floor. I was pinned into that damn seat, and just watching the altimeter go around like this here, and we, we started in that dive, as I vaguely remember, at about 12,000 feet, and we, uh, and we pulled out about 2,000 feet. And this, this the, the pilot was a big, heavy-set, powerful Dutchman. Nothing ever bothered him during the war. But this time, he was white as a sheet. You know, overconfidence can do it to you, you know. And the skin on the airplane was rippled like this. For all intents and purposes, the wings should have come off, you know, but they didn't. But uh, I, I said, there's, there's somebody looking out somewhere <laughs> upstairs, you know, because it, it was an interesting experience. That's the head but, pilot. But don't do it again. <laughs> That's basically my story. Not very exciting. Not very... Uh, oh, very exciting. Now, you, you stayed in the service? I, I, I stayed in the well, reserve. Okay. I stayed in the reserve. I went uh, back to, to Columbia for a while, but I just uh, couldn't sit in the classroom. And uh, I, I got a job. As a matter of fact, uh, I had tried with various uh, defense outfits to get into the engineering field, but they were all laying off people at the end of the war, you know. So I asked the fellow, I was collecting uh, unemployment insurance, and that time I think they called the 5220 Club. 5220 Club, yeah. And I think I'd gone through eight, uh, eight checks, and I said, I, I can't keep doing this. I had two magnificent parents, but they were both sick people, and I had to get a, a couple of dollars somewhere. So I asked the fellow in the counter, I said, how do you get your job, you know? So he sent me down to the New York State Employment Service, and uh, I was interviewed down there. And eventually I got a job with the Labor Department as, as an interviewer interviewing veterans, doing somewhat like you do, but not about uh, combat experiences. But uh, what was also uh, interesting, too, I had, uh, I had nothing to lose in looking for a job. Uh, I remember I went in uh, to the General Motors building at that time. I was crazy about General Motors. To me, that was like the United States government. That was, and they made beautiful automobiles. Uh, I was a nut about that stuff. Uh, I went in there and I said, hell, I'm not going to go to a personnel office. I looked in the menu board, who was the chairman of the board, I think, either chairman of the board or president. A guy named Alfred P. Sloan was, I think, the chairman of the board. And he was on either the 14th or the 24th floor. So I said, that's the one I'm going to go and see. Maybe I can get a job with General Motors, you know. And I got up, and I, when you ask for that floor, assuming it was the 24th floor, everybody in the elevator turns around, who the hell is this guy, you know, because he knows so long. I go in there, and the, and the elevator doors open up into a, a foyer, a gorgeous, gorgeous office, and there's a lovely blue-gray-haired lady sitting on a desk that must have been 10 yards wide, and uh, apparently she was Sloan's secretary, and... Uh, I, uh, she said, Jess, can I help you? I said, uh, okay. She said, what can I do for you? I said, well, I'm looking for a position, not a job, a position. 
well, uh, maybe I can, I can help you. I said, well, I, I really, if it's at all possible, I, I very much wanted to talk to Mr. Sloan. Well, he's in Detroit. We're having some labor problems, she said. And uh, uh, so uh, I think that, that's quite impossible. But uh, since you're looking for a job, did you know Mr. Sloan? So I said, well, yes, I, I knew him. Uh, I've seen pictures of him and stuff <laughs> like that. How far do you go? So I said, well, let me, now she's in a, she has a dilemma. Because it's just possible this character might know Sloan. And it's also, it could be a nut from the word go. But she couldn't take the chance. So she called somebody who was the second vice president in charge of rolling memos at the spitballs or something like that on the floor below. And she says, uh, why don't you just uh, bear with me a minute and we'll go downstairs one floor to see Mr. So-and-so. Anyway, make a long story short, uh, I went down and saw this fellow. I was treated like, uh, like a king. It was so magnificent, you know. Here I am. I had my one green herringbone suit, you know, uh, which didn't look too bad because uh, I had lost a lot of weight. And uh, this fellow was saying, well, exactly what were you looking for? I said, well, I thought maybe I could get my, I was studying engineering at, at night. Maybe I could get my hands dirty with one of your, uh, one of your shops in the city, you know. Mm -hmm. Well, he says, these are all franchise operations. We have nothing, uh, we don't get involved in that. But we have a plant up in Tarrytown, a Chevrolet plant in Tarrytown. Perhaps we can get you located up there. I said, well, that would be very nice, but I never have an automobile, and at that time, very little chance of getting a hold of one. He said, well, how about something in administration? I said, no, that, that's, that's not my cup of tea. Well, now I knew that the, it's, I shot my load, that not, nothing else was going to happen. I was just happy I, I wasn't thrown downstairs. I walked out of there. I tell you, I felt like a million dollars. I thought that was fantastic. What I should have done after that, I was trying to get into show business. I had nothing else. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that's basically my story. I wound up getting a, a job with the Department of Labor and worked my way up. Uh, to director and uh, retired as a director with fraud investigation, basically. And I stayed in the, uh, in the reserve for, well, between the reserve and uh, active duty, uh, it was about 40 years. When did you retire? In 87. Mm -hmm. Do you want to hold that photo up? Yep. I see you rose to the rank of uh, full colonel. colonel. Yeah. You can see how bad things must be in the military. Now, what year was that taken? Oh, God, think, I, uh, I guess it must have been uh, 86 or 87. Okay. I still had a lot, lot more hair there. And uh, gradually the reserve started shrinking and, and I, I accomplished nothing. We were taking courses and I saw no, no sense and I wasn't doing anything of any consequence. And uh, that's what uh, motivated me to, to retire. There's nothing, nothing more I could do of any kind. Were you of called it. up for Korea? I was called up for Korea. I couldn't fly a high altitude anymore. My head was killing me. I used to be on these aspirin every, every damn day. I had this chronic sinusitis. So they took x-rays of my head and everything like that, and they showed it up. So they asked me if I want to volunteer for ground duty. I said, I'm not going to volunteer, but if you want, you put me on orders and call me back. But not for high altitude flying, mm -hmm. I can't do that anymore. So that's basically it. How do you think your uh, time in the service changed or affected your life? I think it was very interesting. I think it was unique. I was very flattered that I was able to do something of some importance and uh, thankful that I uh, got back in one piece. And I met a lot of very wonderful people in there. Mm -hmm. Like you stayed in contact with your... Oh yes, like, with the crew. crew. Oh yeah. Those that are left, yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you belong to any veterans organizations? I or? belong to the VFW. I don't follow that anymore. Mm -hmm. My father used to be in the American Legion. I, I, I didn't join that. Uh, but I had enough, you know, when things were fairly active, uh, I, I, I uh, had enough with the reserve and, uh, 
and stuff like that. And then I became involved with a with a theater out in the Riverhead, uh, and uh, so that kept me occupied for a while. Mm -hmm. But uh, I had very little to do with the military after that. As a matter of fact, what's unique also is uh, when I was still in the reserve, uh, they had sent a letter to me. They were looking for, uh, an, uh, for a person to assign to a uh, position in Washington. It was a, uh, it, it called for a brigadier general, you know, but that doesn't mean you're going to become a brigadier general, you know. But I was, I was very flattered that I would be, I was within the zone of consideration, mm -hmm. along with a, a bunch of other guys, uh, also full colonel, uh, to be considered for it. Of course, that never materialized. So I kept the letter as, as a memento, and that's, that's, that's basically it. Okay. That's, that's it. You mean, okay. All right. Well, thank you very much for your interview. Thank you very much for calling me.